How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, Earl. Thank you. Absolutely. Here good, you good to talk to you again. Here, yeah, here you go again. It's it's time to talk about Zeus the Mighty. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. One of the things that you've always done, and I've loved this because my wife is a school teacher, is that you have made a connection with students and you give them reason to have hope for tomorrow. We know that this is a seven book series, so therefore you, you're giving them something to look forward to. Oh, gosh, thanks. Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, I've done, uh, this is the fifth book that's out now and they come out once a year and I've had you know young readers tell me they read it in a day. <laughs> so... So they, uh, they can read it, and then they just have to wait uh, 364 days till the next book comes out. <laughs> but you know, Crispin, it doesn't feel like a year. It really doesn't feel like a year. No, I know, I know. <laughs> and yeah, I write the, when I write these books, I finished this book about a year ago, so it's always like I've got to sit down and, and, and uh, catch up with where I left off with the characters because uh, I'm always working on the next book. But that's the fun thing about these characters, too, is they're just always, uh, they're always moving. They're always in motion, these pet, pet rescue characters who believe they're Greek gods. And uh, even whenever their one adventure ends, they immediately go right into the next adventure. And you don't even need to read these books in order, really, because you can kind of pick up whichever one has a cover that's the most appealing for a young reader, and they can read it and get uh, familiar with the characters right away, get, get used to the world right away. Uh, and then if they like it, they could pick up previous books in the series. Yeah. Where did you get the idea to come up with a tentacled uh, soothsayer? I mean, it's it's a cool way to just kind of bring something into the story. But, <laughs> but I mean, as an adult, I'm still going, oh, my God, it's an octopus. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, that's the big challenge with this uh, because it does take place in a pet rescue center that's the real world. But these animals, I believe, they're in ancient Greece. So I needed the villain in this installment to be a character from the mythology named Proteus, who is a shapeshifter in mythology, can change into any other form. And uh, the only way to get the soothsayer to tell the future is to capture Proteus when he's sleeping. So I had to think, okay, what kind of animal might be at a pet rescue center that can shapeshift? <laughs> and, you know, having the National Geographic connection, I've written a lot about wildlife and history and animals too. I know that there's an animal called a mimic octopus it can change in, in, in nature. It can change its, the sh its shape and its texture and its color and turn into so it makes itself look like a starfish or a lionfish or various other fish. So I said this is the perfect candidate to be the villain in this book. We'll make Proteus a mimic octopus, and it can be an animal that's on loan to the pet rescue center. Uh, so once once I get all of that, my head wrapped around all of that, then I can just write the story and base it off Greek mythology. Part of that story, the illustrations. I love the way that you evenly balance out the illustrations inside this book. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's a big part of it. You know, just writing the book is only the, the a small task. Then I collaborate with the the artist, who's re really great uh, at, at bringing this world to life. Because some of these concepts are kind of hard to explain, um, and so his illustrations make it kind of take away some of the heavy lifting to have to explain, oh, they're fighting a Hydra monster that in real life is actually a, a toilet that's stuck on flush. So the artist can go in and kind of combine the two ideas. And, you know, and then it's also more appealing to young readers because in that way it's almost like a graphic novel. As they flip the pages, they could see these characters. And, and, and uh, it's not, not quite a comic book, but it's certainly a fast read. It feels like it sometimes. You use the earthquake in a way because, I mean, especially today, there's a lot of earthquakes today. Kids know that story. Now you've put it into a story. Now they can see how there's a lot to be discovered. Yeah. I mean, once again, it comes down to how can I shake things up at the pet rescue center? And honestly, an earthquake is the easiest, <laughs> easiest way to do it. It kind of, uh, it, it, it does. It changes their world. It expands the their ocean that the Aegean Sea which is in the pet center is actually the aquarium um and in this installment they actually so Zeus gets to spend most of it exploring underwater and he does that by walking around inside of a little hamster ball that <laughs> is it's attached to an air supply like a little dive helmet and, and you know it it maybe bends the uh, laws of physics a little bit but uh we're talking about hamsters and cats and dogs that talk to each other and go in Greek uh, we live greekness every night, so I think it's it's forgivable. <laughs> now, when you when you write about animals like that, do you find yourself in real life when you're walking in, in on the streets to, talking to animals? Because I do. I love talking to animals all the time. 
Well, I actually live on a farm. Oh, good. And one of the animals in my book series, Hermes, is a hen. is based on one of our one of our hens. Uh, the artist based her look on on the hen. And so, yeah, I'm always and I call Hermes is one is my favorite hen. I call her my minion. Uh, we have like I don't know at this point over 30 chickens, but uh, <laughs> she's my favorite. And you know, we've got unfortunately the other animals we have. We got donkeys and cows and sheep. They don't quite work in a pet center environment so i don't think they'll be starring in the series but i trust me i just like you i talk to the animals all the time <laughs> oh and chickens were my thing when i was a kid what we would do is before we'd go out and feed the cattle we'd grab we'd go in and grab a hen and then we would take the hen with us to put up on the haystack because they would all if there was a snake or if there was a rat or a mouse up there they would get that before we would be startled by them <laughs> that's, that's awesome that's a great idea yeah they that's one, one of the things i love about them is they will eat the scary insects and the stinging insects and the rats and all that, or scare them away. Be- yep. And they don't before. Well, when I, I actually not too much of a side, but when I lived in Mexico, we had chickens, and I would put a chicken on my shoulder, and they would eat all the mosquitoes that yes. would fly, fly near me. <laughs> they were they're kind of like mosquito force field. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, and even in this forest that I live here, we've got chickens, and some someone's got a rooster. So I, it's fun to be walking through the forest, and you hear that rooster making its sounds. I mean, there's such a story with chickens, and I, I just, and, and I, I just love the fact that you love chickens as well. Oh yeah, and that's I had to put one in in into the series. You know, it it, it, it backyard chicken is such backyard chicken is such a push and a phenomenon right now. So many people are into chickens especially when the prices of eggs went yeah, up, yeah. that uh, I think a lot of people now can relate to seeing a, a hen in a pet rescue center, that, because why not? There, there's just like having any other bird, and, and this one might make you breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to turn this into a podcast series in the way where you can do episodes that are 35, 40 minutes long, so you can have many episodes, or are you going to do something? Because, I mean, it's, it's like, I love the fact that this is book number five, but it's like, okay, now I want to see it in action. Well, gosh, yeah, you know, Disney bought National Geographic a while ago, and they have their own TV channel, so I'm nice. always hoping that they might turn it into like a Disney Plus show, something for, for young viewers, um, but uh, right now there's no plans. There is a podcast uh, where they take the myths, and, and, and it's called Geeking Out, and it's very popular. It was actually started in the book series, and now it exists outside of the book series, um, but yeah, I, I would actually love to see if they would turn the books into something uh, into another format like, you know, a TV show or, or, yeah, it could be like an audio adventure and a podcast. But uh, right now, unfortunately, there's no plans. Wow. Well, congratulations on Zeus the Mighty, the Voyage of the Oddest Sea. I love that, the Oddest Sea. That's a good word there for you, Crispin. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you very much. Please come back to this show. You know the door is always going to be open for you, dude. Oh, I, I'd love to come back. I'll come back next year when the next one comes out, Arrow. Thanks for having me. You bet, Always man. a pleasure. You be brilliant today, okay? <laughs> Thank you. I'll do my best.